I heard from somebody here who worked for you at one time that when she came into the office at 6.30 in the morning, you said good afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> the line was, um, and I don't think I actually ever said it, but um, it sounded actually pretty good. So I, I, uh, if you don't come to work on Saturday, don't bother coming on Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> I see. Okay. <laughs> and another little thing you said, uh, last year I think you said that movies suck. Do you still think they suck? Well, last year they did for sure. No <laughs> question about it. A little bit better this year. Um, you know, it's, uh, you know, movies are as much an art as they are a business. It's show business. And, uh, and so I do think they run through cycles. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, when, when they are great, there is probably no more rewarding experience. Uh, I actually saw a movie on uh, Sunday night uh, called Argo, and uh, I have to say, if you haven't seen it, go see it. It's a wonderful movie. Um, and when you see something that really, you know, you go in, you have that shared experience, a couple of hundred other people, um, there is really nothing, you know, as an entertainment experience, there's almost nothing more rewarding. When they're not so good, it's not such a great experience. <laughs> <laughs> and they cost a lot of money to make. They do. Um, You've also been one of the biggest proponents of 3D in film, and, and you also said that you thought that 3D was going through its terrible twos. But I was interested in uh, reading that in China, 3D has about 65% of the market in theaters. So what are your, talk to us a little bit about these big well, plans for I mean, China. The, yeah, okay, You're well. like Nixon going to China for Hollywood, so. <laughs> Bite your tongue, <laughs> um, Well, first, just on the 3D is, is that, uh, you know, if you look at 3D as an artistic tool, which is uh, how we tried to approach it at DreamWorks, I, I went into a movie theater, uh, totally unexpected uh, now, um, I think in uh, 2004, in an IMAX theater, and I saw this movie, Polar Express. Mm. And I was so uh, uh, just completely... Uh, fascinated by the sense of immersion that I had never felt in a movie theater before, which Bob Zemeckis uh, had created with, uh, really was the first mocap uh, experience. And I came out of that feeling that this was an opportunity to have a new storytelling tool, something that put in the hands of great artists actually could be wonderful. And I, as I think, you know, the entire world experience, when you put the tool in the hands of you know, Jim Cameron and does a movie like Avatar, you know, it really uh, was a remarkable innovation. Uh, unfortunately, which, you know, has not the first time this has happened in Hollywood, there are people that took the high road and there were plenty of people that took the low road and went out and produced sort of cheap ripoffs of it, didn't really treat it as an artistic tool and as a storytelling tool and delivered pretty crummy experiences. And I think that's the terrible twos that uh, it really set it back. Um, there are places in the world where uh, it has had enormous traction, international marketplace, China in particular. Um, you know, my dealings in China have just been uh, incredibly exciting. Uh, it is really a whole different frontier. It's a different world in terms of how you do business, how you think about business. It's uh, you know, it's almost like every time I'm there, I feel like I, I just, I have to do this complete reset because the marriage between, uh, you know, a, a, a capitalist government in which government, bank, law, commerce are all one uh, is so antithetical to every ounce of training that all of us have had in the West. And to go there is just takes a complete reset. Um, and, uh, you know, went there with a big idea that got them very excited. Uh, certainly, Kung Fu Panda I was what opened the you. opened the doors. Uh, you know, in a in an extraordinary way because they saw that um, uh, as something they didn't understand how a Western uh, company could actually take their culture and uh, and their heritage, the, the icon of their country, and do such. Uh, a wonderful job of getting it right. Our artists really got it right. As opposed to so many things that they take offense to. You bet. Um, like Steven Spielberg withdrawing from the Beijing Olympics, things like that. Um, tell me something, um, what are you planning to do actually in China? Um, 
we're going to build a studio there. We're going to make uh, uh, animated movies that are at the level and the quality of what we do here in the States. Um, it will take us some time to do that. Um, you know, making an animated movie takes about four to five years. Just to give you the level of complexity, you know, when you look at, again, the marriage of, you know, technology and, and great storytelling, an average movie has 130,000 frames. Uh, each frame goes through 12 departments. If you think about it in the process of making them from the first storyboard all the way to the final special effects in it. So, and in each department, each frame goes through between as few as 10 and as many as 100 iterations within that department. So it's between three and four billion individual objective, uh, or actually say subjective, creative judgments that are being made along the way. But you're actually going to create a whole new industry in China, right? Of I think so. I mean, and are you going to build theme parks? Are we going to have the DreamWorks, DreamWorks land, like Disneyland, or what's going to happen? Uh, no, I think we'll let them do that. I think we have an idea to do something a little bit different from, from what they're doing there, which is, frankly, of equal value and equal need there in it, but it's not really theme park related. Mm -hmm. But you know, China, five years from now, will be the largest movie market in the world. It'll mm -hmm. surpass the United States uh, and ultimately be many times larger than the United States. Movie going there is something that has quickly become broadly popular um, and continues to um, have incredible enthusiasm there. And so, again, it's just a place of great opportunity if you can figure it out. Are you going to help your fellow studios try to get in since they've been barred by the Chinese so far? Well, they haven't been barred. Uh, well, again, I think. Effectively. No, they're not. I mean, it's, it has gotten better. You know, when, when uh, uh, Vice President Xi was here in, in March, and uh, our Vice President Biden actually did a fantastic job of getting them to expand the market. I mean, here's the thing, which is, and every, you know, every country in the world experiences this. Um, in the last uh, uh, six months, the first six months of this year, uh, the movie uh, business in China was pretty much 50-50 domestic production and international productions. Uh, and now with the change of quotas, as well as the success of the Western product there, uh, in the first six months of this year, it has now gone up to over 70%. And, you know, we've seen this in other countries around the world in which they're happy to have our product there, but they also want to homegrown. Mm -hmm. And they want to encourage, you know, their own industry and to have their own filmmakers and, you know, to enjoy their own commercial success. And, you know, so some people, you know, you would say, well, I think if you left it unfettered, you know, maybe it would be 90% and no industry would grow there. Mm -hmm. So here is a, uh, you know, a government that is, has a very obviously strong hand in the way commerce works there, uh, who has said, we need to ensure that we actually have uh, a great local filmmaking uh, 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 economy. Do you feel that your closeness with the Obama administration helped you make that wedge into China? For sure not. No? <laughs> <laughs> no. And I don't mix the two. And uh, my, I uh, literally have never asked uh, our government to do anything on our behalf there. Um, the ambassador to China actually is someone who is a friend of mine. I actually, first time I met, met Jeff was at the uh, US Embassy in Beijing last year. We happened to be there at the same time. And I literally was going by making a social call on on uh, our ambassador, and he was there. He has a beautiful art installation there. Um, so, um, no. The answer, the short answer is no. <laughs> okay. Um, talk to me a little bit about why animation became your passion so much. Because before you were at Disney and Michael Eisner gave you that job, you go revive this moribund so, uh, place. Yeah. So the first day I came to work, 1984, I'm not a student of animation. I'd probably seen a couple of these movies as a kid growing up like most people. Uh, and uh, I went to Michael's office, and uh, we had worked together for 11 years at Paramount, 10 years at Paramount. And I, I went to his office and uh, sort of had my to-do list. He had hired me to be the head of the uh, studio, the movie and television, and uh, came in with my little buck slip of the 
my to-do list and you know, spent an hour with him and said, you know, kind of here are the things I was thinking about as the sort of first priorities and uh, you know, went through it. He said, great, you know, here were some things that were important to him. And I was literally one foot out the door, literally at the door going out. And he said, Jeffrey, one thing before you leave, uh, I, I forgot to mention to you. I said, what's that? He said, come over here. I want to show you something. And he pointed out the window of his office to a building just across the street. He had Walt Disney's old office is where he was. And he pointed across the street to this building. He said, do you know what they do there? I said, no, I have no idea. He said, well, that's actually where they make the animated movies. I went, oh, well, that's interesting. He said, and it's your problem. And that was my introduction to animation. So what got you so involved? Was Walt Disney the visionary, just something oh, that? Yes, I mean, there was no, um, so, so first it was a job and a responsibility. And uh, I didn't know anything about it, so I figured I'd, I'd learn. The great thing is, is that Walt Disney uh, had the most amazing archive of his work and his work product and his work process that you can imagine. Every single thing that he did on his classic movies was archived in sequence in the process of making the film. And uh, I had stumbled upon this. And you know, I always say, you know, Walt Disney left breadcrumbs the size of Volkswagens. You'd have to be <laughs> deaf, dumb, and blind not to be able to follow that path. And so I, I really consider myself 100% a student of Walt Disney. I learned you know, pretty much everything I know about it. But to answer your question is, is that for me, uh, what be started as a job became a love and a passion because in the world of creating art and storytelling, um, unlike anything else I, I, I have experienced, it is a team sport um, in that it really takes uh, a, a, a village of people, of, of artists with a shared vision um, uh, and this amazing uh, long-term perspective on, on, you know, on what, what the goal is to do. And every single thing that you see in an animated movie is from somebody's imagination. Everything. There's n none of it exists in the real world. I was uh, struck to also learn from somebody here uh, that Walt Disney wasn't sure he was going to be successful, so his studio was built right across the street from a hospital, so he made the whole studio for gurneys to pass through the doorways, painted the same awful hospital green, just in case he had to sell the property to the hospital it, if the studio didn't work. It's literally true. It was designed as a hospital with wards off of it. And and and, and no shadows ever hit the animator's boards. It was always the sun. Yeah, natural light. So you come up here to Silicon Valley quite a bit. I mean, no, we're not there. <laughs> but you go to Silicon Valley quite a bit now, don't you? I mean, haven't well, you begun some yeah, kind I mean, of DreamWorks about I mean, what, only, are you, what are you learning from that? Well, uh, you know, we are, uh, you know, we, we are as technically advanced in the world of digital image creation as any company in the world today. We require uh, uh, state-of-the-art technology to be able to achieve the things that we do. Um, we have had, you know, some amazing strategic partnerships, uh, deep, deep R&D partnerships over the years. One that we're just finishing a four-year project with Intel. Uh, that's probably the largest, you know, pure R&D project done in the entertainment industry, uh, you know, maybe ever. Honestly, what is it? It's a, you, it's a. It's called scalable multi-core processing. Now, do you know what it is? No. <laughs> well, it allows us to achieve what is a holy grail in animation, which is to, for our animators to be able to work in real time and to actually see their work as they're, as they're doing it. Today, um, uh, you know, our artists actually almost work blind, if you will. They, uh, uh, they uh, do the equivalent of painting a frame uh, through their uh, imagination, they send it down, and eight hours later, it comes back as something rendered. Um, what what you know, multi-core processing allows them to do is to now actually see their work as they're doing it. And so, here's a perfect example of technology um, being maybe the most powerful paintbrush ever put in the hands of animators and artists. So Silicon Valley, we have a studio uh, in Redwood Shores in Palo Alto. We've been there for 20 years. We have 800 uh, artists that, that work there. Uh, and so uh, you know, we are sort of at that perfect intersection of state-of-the-art technology and you know, great storytelling. And uh, we rely on Silicon Valley 
Um, you know, we, we, we couldn't do what we do without them. I was struck yesterday when J.J. Abrams was saying that it didn't matter how much technology you have if you didn't have humanity at the center of your, of your product, of your pictures. And I wondered if you could give us a couple of examples of hits and misses because of the lack of humanity, perhaps. Um, well, I'm not sure I have that. I, I, I do agree with J.J. that, you know, um, uh, it ultimately is always comes back to, you know, emotions and great characters and, and great storytelling and all the bells and the whistle in the world. You know, I mean, you know, I, I mean, we've all seen this. I mean, you have movies that come out that, uh, what was it, uh, Battleship, you know, or Biggest Effects or John Carter of Mars and, you know, and, and these things are terrible, terrible misses. Um, you know, with all the resources in the world to, to, to do it, they forgot their storytelling. And so, you know, I think that is at the very much at the core of what we do. There's something uh, fascinating about the process of how we make animated movies. So here's an interesting uh, fact. We've, uh, DreamWorks Animation has now made 17 CG animated movies. And every single one of them, every one of them has been a hit. Pixar has made 13 CG animated movies, and every single one of them is a hit. So you have these two companies together have produced 30 movies, and the track record is 100%. Whereas in the live action movie business, the hit ratio is about one in four. Is that because of your worldwide audience? No, it's because of the way in which we go about our movies. It's the way in which we um, make our movies, uh, see our movies as works in progress. It's an iterative process. We get to see what doesn't work about them. We have an extraordinary collaboration with our audiences every step along the way of films. JJ, who is someone who I've known for many, many years, um, I actually gave him his very first job as a writer when he graduated out of uh, uh, college, uh, came over and visited uh, DreamWorks about a year or so ago because he was interested in seeing some of our process, and in particular 3D, which he was considering for um, Star Trek. And when we took him through at the end of the process, he said to me, well, you cheat. <laughs> That's not fair. You get to make your movie, look at it in storyboard or in you know, pre-visualization, and you see what doesn't work, and you can even put it in, you know, in various forms in front of audiences and this, and kind of get that feedback. And so uh, you know, there's something amazing about that, that process. It's a little bit like a, 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 you know, a show. You know, a theater show in which you can right. preview them and shut them down, and you know, go, you know, dress rehearse them and go back to work on them. The last thing we do is animate our movies. Well, talking about shows, we have a big one tonight. Uh, the debate. Have you given uh, the president some advice? Uh, no, I don't believe this is a president one gives advice to. <laughs> I no, think. I guess not, considering what happened to the last one. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, listen, I'm a uh, you know I'm a great fan of the uh, of the presidents. I I think he inherited you know just the maybe the worst hand that any president has in modern history. Um, I think that he is uh, through very troubling times uh, had a very steady hand um, in the most divisive uh, political environment our country has been in in probably 30 or 40 years um, and. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm amazed at what politics has become today. I started in politics, as you right, know. Right, John I, Lindsay. I literally worked for John Lindsay, was mayor of New York. Politics has been important to me my whole life. I, I believe in actively participating um, uh, in it. I think it's important that we all do. Um, and yet today, uh, you know, the truth doesn't seem to matter too much. And I find that very disturbing. I find that the, 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 um, disruption of the sort of democratic process, the fact that unlimited money today uh, But can you're raising respect. it all. I am because you fight fire with fire. I, again, I had a, I will tell you, you know, one of the real, I started Priorities USA about a year and a half ago. I can tell you President Obama specifically asked that I not do it. He said, I think it is unmor immoral, unethical, and undemocratic. And you're doing it. And I said to him, you're right. The problem is it's legal. And the other side is doing it. And I didn't do it in 2010, again, asked not to. And I felt it was a terrible mistake, uh, you know, the result of letting it go unchecked. 
Um, and, and I said to him, I'm, I, I really, I just, I feel like this is something that has to happen. And the best thing that we can do is hopefully put you back in the White House, uh, maybe appoint a couple of Supreme Court justices and overturn it because it is terrible. But you're not going to lay down. And unfortunately, to a large degree, many in the Democratic Party have done it. And I think to a, you know, to a disastrous effect. One last question. Um, well, now, because you're very important now, because Hollywood money has become, I guess, the most important money in the campaign now that a lot of Wall Street has turned against the president. And you're right in the middle between Silicon Valley that wants internet freedom and Hollywood that wants its intellectual property somehow rewarded. So do you foresee yourself playing any role in that fight? Well, we've had, and frankly, I mean, the Valley's Google, winning, obviously. No, I, I have to say, it's not. It's not a winning or losing. The, you know, the, the uh, Hollywood, uh, and through the MPAA drafted a ridiculous uh, uh, bill that had no business being SOPA. SOPA's dead. Uh, it, 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 and, and yet what uh, the goals in terms of what uh, Hollywood was trying to uh, accomplish, although as I said, in a, in a badly flawed bill uh, that did not deserve to, to even get as far as it did. And the fact is, I, I'm happy to say this, you know, for our hosts here today, uh, you know, once the dust settled off of the skirmish of, 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 of SOPA, uh, you know, they've been incredibly uh, responsive, uh, understand the protection of intellectual property, and the protection of intellectual property and a free and open internet are not mutually exclusive to one another. And I have to say, Nikesh and Kinzel have been, you know, two of the leading people in the Valley, and I've just tried to, you know, help uh, marshal the people down in uh, Hollywood to, to understand that, that we actually have you know, mutual goals to, to do, and we're going to get this done together. It's not going to get done by Washington. Good. What we need to get done is going to get done between all of us, and then Washington can put their stamp of approval on it. But it was a broken, busted process, um, and uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm happy to say it's probably on a pretty good footing right now today. And, you know, post-election, regardless of whether it's Democratic or Republican, uh, I'm sure there will be a, a well-crafted, well-informed piece of legislation that will ultimately make its way into, into law that will uh, be good for the internet and will be good for the protection of intellectual property. Last question, um, because you have been very generous with, with your philanthropy. Um, Tell us what you heard from Kirk Douglas, which sort of started you off on uh, philanthropy. Yeah, I, it was interesting. I made a, a, you know, it's in the 1980s, I made a movie with, the last movie that Kirk Douglas and Burt Lancaster did together. And uh, they were shooting uh, the film on the, on the Disney lot at the time. And I went to visit Kirk at lunchtime in his trailer. And, um, you know, most actors, particularly, you know, at that point, uh, you know, at lunchtime, you know, it's just a time to sort of relax and, you know, it's a long day standing in front of actually lights and cameras, you know, it's, uh, it's, a, it's, it's physically demanding. And uh, when I went to this trailer, there was just like wall to wall uh, uh, people with blueprints and lawyers and it must have been 15 people packed into this trailer. And uh, looking at uh, uh, blueprints for playgrounds and I, and I said, you know, I said, what are, you, what are you doing? He said, well, come in. I want to show you this. And Kirk and his wife, Ann, uh, set out a program uh, in the early 80s to rebuild every single inner city playground at every single school in Los Angeles. Personally, he funded this. He designed this in it. And, and I s said to him, I said, I'm just curious. I mean, you know, with all the things that are going on, you know, how do you find the, the time to do this? And he said, uh, which are the words that I have, I have never forgotten and quite inspired me. He says, you haven't learned how to live until you've learned how to give. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much, you. Jeffrey.